Welcome to another episode of RedTalks.Live, your home of ranting, engineers, and DevOps. And today I have with me from GitHub, Christian Weather. Say hi, Christian. Hey, how you doing? Fabulous to have you back on again. Christian's been on with us before. He has so much experience and amazing advice that we couldn't let him go without coming back a second time. Um, <laughs> how's things? What's been going on? Uh, things are great. Just uh, dealing with the cold here in Chicago, but uh, overall, just uh, happy to help and uh, help you all uh, teach the lessons of GitHub, I guess. So it's great. Thank you. Excellent. So we have Christian back on because, well, the people at GitHub really do understand um, collaboration and open source. And um, I couldn't think of anyone better to talk to about this topic. But I, I feel like we're kind of in a little bit of a need of a reset um, because like GitHub's hit kind of critical mass. Like you're not even really doing technology if you haven't put something on GitHub. I feel like that's where we're kind of at right now. But with that mass adoption, I think we've gone a little, the pendulum's gone a little too far the other way. And now it's almost like there's some specklings of irresponsible use of GitHub where it's just been like, oh, here's my code and I'm, I'm never gonna communicate with you about it or accept your pull requests or, or even give you any good documentation. And I wonder if maybe we should have a conversation about like, what, what is it really all about? Open source and, and, and that kind of thing. So. I don't know. First, I'm, am I insane, Christian? I mean, I, I don't see that kind of behavior often, but you, do you see that sometimes as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, when we think about this idea of open source software development, you know, it's exactly right. A lot of organizations, whether or not they're enterprise or they're small to medium businesses, have really caught on to this way of sty uh, this style of software development. And what happens in a lot of organizations is they sort of adopt this. Let's just go ahead and put all of our code out into, into the community. And we're instantly going to build really goodwill with the open source community. And we're going to get a lot of contributions and we're going to be uh, in this really great and perfect world. Now, what happens is the open source community is very opinionated about the way that they like to work. And so when a lot of enterprise organizations uh, uh, put their code out into the into the ether, so to speak, um, they're really not thinking about some of the best practices and some of the uh, things that they need to be doing to really not only effectively increase the amount of collaboration that's happening within their software development project, but also increasing the amount of outside contributors uh, to their projects. Uh, one of the things that I think open source has done really well from my perspective is really open the door for this inclusion of uh, everybody uh, to be uh, able to contribute to projects. So we need to think about what that means for uh, organizations that are beginning to think about this sort of open style, open source style uh, method of working and ways that we can encourage uh, that sort of mindset, whether that's documentation, whether that's getting people to contribute to pull requests, or just getting visibility and eyes on code. There are things we can think about to encourage this community style of development. Absolutely. Oh, wait, wait a minute there, Christian. You, you're not. I don't just have to put a couple of comments in and think that the job's done. No, you, there's uh, there's actually a lot more to it, and you'll probably need to think about community uh, uh, administrators and community organizers and all of those fun things to really help moderate uh, your community uh, when you're starting to build an open source style uh, uh, method of development. Absolutely. It sounds like what you're describing, it's almost like um, if I'm going to commit to actually sharing something, um, therefore, I, I then actually have a responsibility for what I'm sharing. It's not like I'm just piping to dev null and whatever. Um, if, if I'm, if I'm going to say, hey, look at my code, well, it would be really wrong of me to then not expect someone to ask a question. And therefore, I should be available to answer that question or even accept that feedback um, graciously and say, hey, that actually is an interesting idea. Let's explore that. It's, it's, yeah. it's a responsibility of like I'm I'm putting it out there that I might actually get some interaction and I should be prepared for that before I make the decision to putting it out there. Absolutely. And, and, and just to take a pump the brakes, pr pump the brakes there just for a second. When people think about responsibility in terms of putting code out there, one of the first things that we think about traditionally is just compliance and legal, right? So we get our code out into the, into the space and then we put an MIT license on it or a, a BSD license on it. And we say that everything's okay. Our code is now uh, able to be used by other users. And then I don't have to do anything. Maybe I've got a couple of lines of uh, comments within the code itself, or I've uh, got a really basic readme. 
but really there's a lot more to that. So one of the things that we think about as a, like a first best practice to really just kind of jump into it is that when you're putting code out on uh, onto GitHub as a, on our platform, you really need to have that documentation in place. And one of the things that we think of as a starting point is the readme within every, within every project and within every subfolder. Why is that important? Well, if I am an open source user, and an open source user can be anybody, we've got 30 million uh, users on our platform, and they range the gamut from anybody that you can think of, and even folks that you're not thinking about that are developers. So I'm a Microsoft, or I'm an Apple, or I'm a Google, or I'm a small to medium business that is putting uh, a piece of my code out there into the, into the universe, and I'm saying, I want other people to use this. Well, if I am a developer that's not familiar with that organization, I may have no idea how to run or execute that code. Or it might be a technology that I'm interested in, but I have really no concept or uh, starting point to learn and on, uh, learning on, on how to compile and execute that code. So when we're thinking about like a first best practice, what we want is that readme to not only explain what that project is doing in terms of the, the value proposition for that developer or the customer that's gonna be using that software, but we also want specific detailed information on how to get that environment up and running. Because if we want people to contribute, they obviously need that application or that code running in a state where they can feel like they can, can contribute. That's one of the biggest pitfalls and one of the biggest mistakes I see a lot of uh, organizations doing is they'll put code out there and then they'll have a make file. And then there's a big expectation that a developer knows how to use a make file. Which, you know, in some cases, when we think about traditional software development, yes, it is, there is that expectation there. But if we're thinking about students and new developers that are on our platform, we have so many of them. And we want to be able to have a, a, a culture of collaboration and a culture of community. And one of those things that we think about is sort of being over the top in terms of uh, our documentation, right? We do this internally at GitHub as well. So when we think about, you know, our organization under github.com slash github, Every project has to have a readme, and we enforce that behavior through the idea of status checks and, and our, our commits API that say if a file is not present, such as the readme, then we go ahead and enforce that behavior by uh, uh, notifying the user of uh, those lacks, uh, that, that deficiency. So what that does is when I have a new employee coming into the GitHub organization or we have a new outside contributor, they know exactly where to go to get information and they know how to start, uh, they know how to start to, they know how to get going with that as well. That's really cool advice. This, I'm sorry, I, I had like eight different questions of totally different Absolutely. things coming to my mind just then. Yep. Um, one of them on the, on the whole like, um, supporting like how to keep something running like I that, that you, you made me think of something um what, so one of the projects I was working on I came to the realization trying to get someone else's library running that I didn't know their environment of what that library expected to talk to and that's why I couldn't get it running at all if that actually just explained to me like oh no we set it up this way this is how we do our fault tolerance it would have taken me 10 minutes instead of half a day of me wasting time so to as, as I pay it forward, my expectation, what I did for that code is whenever I set up the environment, I updated my Docker compose file that built up the back end I was expecting to, to work with. So if anyone was having any trouble, they could recreate the environment that I was developing in just by doing a git pull against the, the back end. In fact, this is massive plug for gist. GitHub gist, that's where I just put my, look, this is my dev environment. If you want to see how yep. it works, just run that and you can modify it and tweak it later. But, but this is how to just see the experience of it. And and that's what I was meaning. That That's the part of kind of responsibility that I think of. Like, don't, it, it just mic drop, don't do that with code. That's not how <laughs> open source, you don't just, right. yeah. I, I think add on top of that, and I think Docker is a really good example of this. Uh, when you're writing documentation on how to get your build environment up and running, and in my opinion, the build environment is always the most sort of frustrating experience for a developer, at least in my my experience. One of the things that we need to think about is never assume that somebody understands your build environment or your build technology. And I think Docker is a really good example of that. I think Docker is really Docker and Kubernetes and all, you know all these container-based you know technologies and orchestrators are really great uh, sort of game-changing tools. But if we think about in terms of industry adoption, they're still pretty fairly low in my anecdotal experience. So when we're writing all of these cool tools that are building into these types of containers and all these really cool things, we can't just assume that somebody knows how to run a Docker file. We can't just assume that if we put a Docker file in there, 
somebody's going to be able to go in there and be able to know that they need to run Docker build to build that environment. So one of the things that we do is we're sort of uh, uh, over. Uh, we use overly verbose language when we when we say what technologies we're using. So. What does that mean? That means that if we're referring to a Docker environment, we're creating hyperlinks for all the documentation in our sort of core repositories that say, we're using Docker, and then there will be a link to the Docker documentation to get started with that as well. So if I'm an experienced developer, I don't need to click on that necessarily, but if I'm an inexperienced developer, I don't necessarily have the context switch to get to Google and say, well, what is Docker? I have that within the documentation right there, or what is Node, or what is Packer, or what are these other open source technologies that we're using? So when we think about that, that's that's one of the other, that's one of the other big things. It's using gist, it's using wikis, it's it's using you know the issues and the readmes itself to just really put all that information uh, as close to the co close to the close to the code as uh, as possible. Um, yeah, I think that's a that's a really good starting point. So I, I just remembered another example when you were just talking about just at the end there. Um, I, I mean, I, I talked with several people when I was working this out and everybody said, yeah, I remembered that being an absolute pain, but I can't remember how I got it working. And I was working with file ownership and permissions in Node.js. And there's kind of overlap in the way those mech, it's not clear mm -hmm. and it's not clean. And I it took a, too much time for me to work that out. When I got it working, I just copied that function out of my code put it in a public gist and was like, look, if the next time I'm just sending a link to that. I, I love gist. It's like little mini repos that you can just be like, there, code, stay. Um, yep. can't, can't speak more highly of, of that. That was a great feature add-on. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, the gist really kind of uh, allow developers to not only necessarily think of large scale projects within, or I wouldn't even say large scale projects, but projects within a repository, but a lot of times it's just little snippets of code, right? And you'll see, especially when you look at like, uh, 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 when you're searching for code snippets on Google, you know, a lot of times you'll go to Stack Overflow, but then a lot of times the second and third results will also be the GitHub gist. And you'll see a lot of times the conversations that are being built around that. And then from there, you can kind of see how code evolves over time, not only from the conversation that's happening, but from the commit, you know, from the edits that are being made to the gist as they grow as well. Yeah. The other thing I found that I, it's, it's almost like I'm getting kickbacks from gist or something, but the other really cool thing that I found with this yeah. is that it stopped me losing things. I have like snippets of code in certain projects, but I can't remember where I was solving that problem and I can't find stuff again, but moving it out of my machine and my personal dev environment and giving that bit of advice to the world actually has helped me because now I know oh, I have to stand up a new environment and it's a 10 minute job now because I just go back yep. and make just and then, oh, that's how I spun up, you know, graphite DB and Grafana uh, in a single Docker Compose file that I forgot where I put. Um, so that's really well. So and on this theme, that there was a term that I, I think in the very, very early days of GitHub. Correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, initially it was a code sharing platform, but really early on that pivoted. And I think there was like that aha moment of what GitHub was going to be about in the future, and it, it pivoted to the term social coding. Yeah, and I exactly. Love that term. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of? I, I think that's generally the theme of what we're talking about, isn't it? It's not just sharing bits, it's it's social coding. Right, so yeah, to kind of give you a little bit of history of why you know why GitHub was founded. So our company was founded in 2008 by our uh, three core founders, Chris, Tom, PJ, and then with help from Scott Chacon as well. Uh, and the reason why we started GitHub was for a couple different reasons, but if we take a step back from a couple years before GitHub and we think about what Git was, Git was written in 2005 in response to licensing changes on where the Linux kernel was hosted. And what Linus did with the Linux product or with Git itself was really solved a couple of problems, right? He solved problems around distributed software development and uh, solved the problem of the licensing issues with this kernel. So this really took off like wildfire in the open source community because you had developers that were working on these open source projects that were all around the world. And when they were using traditional uh, uh, centralized version control systems, it was really hard to check in and check out code. It was hard to develop for developers to work offline. And there just really wasn't a, a lot of collaboration uh, outside of the code base or inside of the code base that was happening. So our founders really saw that gap, right? And they said, we're working on our own projects. We need a way to sort of unify all of this collaboration onto one single platform. So in 2008, that's where our, our founders really saw that and said, let's go ahead and start this sort of uh, UI on top of Git and let's start calling it GitHub, right? 
so it was great. It was a, it was a collaboration platform. We had issues. We introduced the idea of the pull request, but really pivoting into this idea of social coding is exactly what you're talking about, Nathan. It's this idea that software development isn't just necessarily an isolated thing that one individual is doing. It's projects that are being worked on by many, many different people, right? And we, when we think about some of the larger projects that are being worked on on GitHub today, you know, one of the ones that I think about is the VS Code project on, on GitHub. Now, obviously we are part of Microsoft, but even prior to the acquisition, I think the VS Code project was probably one of the better examples of what you can really do for an organization to open up this idea of social coding. And it means that not it means that everyone's a contributor. It doesn't matter if you're uh, just a read-only person who's observing the code base. It doesn't matter if you're an outside contributor that's you know helping to update documentation, or you're a core contributor that's helping maintain uh, that code base on a long-term basis. It means that everyone is contributing in, in some way to that code base. And so when we think of social coding, it's again not this idea of isolation, but this idea that everyone is contributing. What I think it also means and what it's done for our industry is really shifted this idea away from, again, isolated software development to more community or oriented style development, meaning that we are all responsible citizens of the projects that we're working on. And it's up to us to maintain sort of best practices and behaviors from there as well. One of the best and one of the worst things that we can think of in terms of opening a project to 6 billion people or 30 million users on the platform is sometimes we have disagreements and arguments with people, right? And so when we think about sort of that community style uh, uh, development and, uh, and things like that, GitHub has really helped uh, communities really uh, mitigate uh, not so great behavior through the things, uh, through the ideas of our, our codes of conduct and really having moderators being able to moderate that content as well. Because uh, what that allows us to do is allows us to bring anybody in as a contributor and allows us to bring in uh, a diversity of opinion from there as well. That's that's really cool. Um, and, and I love that you just gave that example um, with the, the with VS Code. I, I My experience at the last GitHub universe, I, I want to just draw on that because it's very much related sure. to behavior, like you were saying, like treat treat when you share your not share when when you yeah share your code on on github in a repository that that is public treat it almost like that that is a meetup that that there's people there that will have thoughts and opinions and that you should be available to share them if, if you're not going to do all of that then what why are you fronting up are you just are you just kind of trying to get some street cred but i i I loved that at GitHub Universe, I went to the, the Microsoft Word sponsor, obviously. Um, and I, I went yeah. and started speaking. I saw a demo of VS Code and I was standing there in the kind of in the background. I wasn't really expecting to have a chat with anyone. And someone approached me um, from, from that stand and said, oh, do you have any questions? And I said, well, it's not really specific to, to VS Code. Um, I was having some problem trying to get um, the, the VS Code GitHub pull requests extension to do a very specific thing in my weird private GitHub Enterprise like lab environment that I, I don't think it was designed. And within a minute, she opened her laptop and said, well, oh, I'm actually one of the maintainers of that project. And I think this is the function that you're referring to. We could just do this right here. And I was like, that's the kind of behavior that we that social coding is about. It's not just I'm hiding behind my laptop in an anonymous kind of environment. No, I'm bringing that behavior of helping and collaborating and contributing, being present, and yep. I'm bringing that to a digital platform. Is, is that, I'm speaking on GitHub's behalf, but to me, that's what it was all about. Yes, absolutely. It's empowering and motivating behavior, right? Because we know that like, as individuals and as, uh, 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 as individuals, we are not all, you know, we have only so many ideas and so many ways to solve problems, right? And if we want to think about bringing in sort of that diversity of opinion and that diversity of thought, and I don't mean that in just terms of, you know, uh, DNI from a traditional perspective, but a, a DNI from a, a, a brain perspective, if we want people to come in with different perspectives to figure out uh, different ways to solve problems, we need we need folks to feel like they are motivated and empowered to do so. So when we think about that kind of behavior, the behavior that we want to encourage is exactly what you experienced with uh, maybe that Microsoft product manager or whoever that was that you talked with with uh, VS Code. It's folks that have sort of that desire and that want to help, right? Uh, and once you do that, it's not about just helping Nathan Pierce. It's also about helping uh, the brand new developer that just downloaded VS Code for the first time or the second time and said, oh my God, I've got a really great idea for an extension. How do I get started? 
by having that sort of documentation already there or having that sort of presence, uh, it, whether that's at a conference or online, will then empower, empower and motivate people to uh, want to contribute. Now, if I look at other communities, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to name and shame because it's that's not my game. But sometimes you will come across communities where it can feel very uh, disconcerting can feel very demotivating to want to contribute back. And I would say that some of those projects suffer from that uh, because we want people to be involved. Now, that's not to say that we want non quality code coming into our code bases. That's what our maintainers are responsible for. But we want our maintainers to have the right attitude that will allow for that diversity of opinion and that diversity of thought to come in and contribute. Nice, nice. I, I, this, I, I'm getting very hand wavy and animated in this one because it's something I'm really passionate about, and I think I, I just I think we all get better quality solutions and interactions by by bringing this people culture to the platform. Um, great that you you mentioned that Microsoft example there. Um, with VS Code and just the way that they're, they're very receptive, the kind of interaction, et cetera. Any other yeah. favorite examples you might uh, be able to share with it? In fact, one of my other favorite ones, actually, OctoKit. <laughs> yes. Tell us, let's build a little bit. That's like the, the node plugin for a uh, node module for, for communicating with the, the GitHub uh, REST API. Yeah, and it's actually not just for nodes. So for those unaware, OctoKit is our uh, API, uh, uh, our are officially supported uh, API libraries for a number of languages. So the ones that we officially support from a github.com perspective are Node. I think we have a Java one. We have a Ruby one that's uh, massively used. Uh, we had a Python one for a while, but to be honest, there was a better uh, uh, Python GitHub library that we've uh, helped collaborate on, but it's not officially called OctoKit. Um, it's called GitHub 3, I think. Um, so I like it a lot. I'm a, I'm a Python. I'm probably one of, the, uh, one of the few Python people at GitHub. So. Um, <laughs> I think that's fantastic, but yeah, it, it's really just about being able to get get folks uh, uh, supported and using our APIs. Yeah, yeah. No, I, but, but the reason I brought that one up though is, I mean, there's been a few things when I was first looking at that, um, and, and I was using a, a horrible dev environment. I had self signed untrusted certificates, and I was using IP addressing instead of domain names. So yeah, kind of make it do stuff it just you shouldn't kind of do. But it was really cool actually that I got response. Um, people were very welcoming. I mean, it oh, yeah. shows that the developers at GitHub really embrace the social coding kind of mantra that, that this should all be about because I felt welcomed and my yep. questions were never made to make me feel stupid for asking them. In fact, I, I got the impression that people were like, I think I know what you're doing. You're learning without doing some proper stuff. Um, they were like, yeah, yeah. have some help. <laughs> yeah, no, and then to answer your other question, other, other organizations that uh, I think are doing a really great job. I mean, this is not me just talking really, really great of my bosses, but I think, you know, Microsoft really has really shown uh, in the last 10 years as such a, like a, um, openness to this idea of open source software development. And I'm not going to repeat some of the things that they used to say about, you know, their opinions on Linux and what they what they thought of open source style, software development. I think we can Google that and see what they thought. But, you know, since, uh, you know, Satya has come in and started running the organization, we've really seen from an open source perspective, their willingness not only to adopt open source technologies uh, within their own products, but to also give back. You know, prior to the acquisition and before the acquisition talks even started, they became our largest contributor of open source software on GitHub.com. And to really see that shift in terms of uh, thinking and their openness to it is really motivating. Now, when I think about, you know, large enterprise organizations taking that sort of same approach, you know, you look at, you know, some of the bigger like FANG organizations like Netflix are really doing great things in the open source. But even then, if we think about like our traditional F100 and our Fortune 50 companies, you know, folks like Allstate and John Deere and uh, even like GE are really starting to adopt open source uh, strategies. And I think I bring that into two different you know buckets. They're building open source strategies around uh, uh, the code that's already living within that enterprise organization, but they're also starting to adopt open source uh, strategies around how can we work like an open source project in our own internal environments? How can we uh, encourage open develop open style development. How can we encourage transparency? And so when I think about like what you know we've seen at GitHub in terms of the enterprise space, I mean, you could probably name a Fortune 100 company, and I could probably find out what their enter what their open source enterprise strategy is because that's exactly what they're thinking about in terms of the next generation of uh, software development. You know, I think uh, about five, you know, 10, 
10 or 15 years ago, Mark Andreessen said that every company was becoming a software company. And then our CEO, uh, a couple of years, our old CEO, Chris, a few years ago said that every company was becoming an innovation company. I think that's absolutely true. If we think about what companies are trying to do and what they're trying to accomplish, the intellectual property is no longer uh, the software that they're writing. It's the amount of data that they're holding on to. So it doesn't necessarily serve the interest of an enterprise organization to hold on to the code that they're writing. It, what it really behooves them to do is give that code back to encourage use of their platform and then allows that for them to consume the data that they need they need in order to become an innovation company as well. Then when we think about recruitment and retention, right? We want, you know, these organizations want to attract top talent, right? And if we think about what that top talent is doing today, a lot of them are already contributing back to open source and they're already used to and acclimated to the style of development. And then if we think about you know students, right? Students are already using GitHub. We know this extensively from our, our, our educational program. So if they're thinking about the folks that they want to uh, recruit for the next generation, then over the next 10, 20, 30 years, they need developers that are already familiar with not only our platform, but also with that method of thinking as well and that way of uh, software development as well. That's cool. And um, well, we're, we're kind of out of time on this episode. I think we covered some really important, really big things. <laughs> I, I, sorry? Uh, I said, uh, great. <laughs> oh, uh, um, I just wanted to drop in, though, a, a site that people should go to um, if they are new to all of this and they want to understand more, which is lab.github.com. There is a lot of fantastic resources on there. I mean, anything you're going to kind of run into um, as your start of this kind of journey, that that's my go-to place. Just get, getting some skills in a safe sandbox environment with Git, always good yep. to get that outside of your actual <laughs> code. Our, our um, service team has done such an amazing, amazing job of building that site out. We call it Learning Lab uh, for those that are unfamiliar with it. And it's a way for you to start understanding what not only uh, uh, open source software development looks like, but what sort of using the github.com platform looks like. I think it's fantastic, 100%. Yeah, and not just how to use Git, I mean, how to do continuous integration. And, and yep. it's like, it's really cool. So. Uh, Fantastic to have you on again, Christian. Um, you are a world of awesome knowledge um, in yourself. So thanks for sharing your your thoughts there on like social coding. And to me, to me, this is just this isn't a, a nice to have. If you if you're gonna if you're gonna come to the party, be present. Don't don't yep. sit in the corner and stare at the wall. I mean, like that that's <laughs> just what's the point of the point? Right. Really, you can come to the party, need all the cookies, but that gets boring after a while. Eventually, you're gonna have to talk to somebody, right? Exactly, yeah, exactly. And people are fun. So um, Yes, they are. This has been another episode of Red Talks Live. You've been listening to Christian Weber. Thanks for coming on, Christian. Thank you. Have a great I, day. Thank you. And I've been your host, Nathan Pierce. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.